Hello, good evening. Uh, my name's Angela Cork, and it's great to see that we have quite a crowd watching this evening from across the UK and further afield. Welcome to this interview webinar, which is hosted this evening by Contemporary British Silversmiths. And I will be in conversation with Richard Fox. I'll be asking him about his successful career in the silver industry. And this event has been generously supported by the London Assay Office. We'd like to thank them also for their continued partnership during London Craft Week. Before I make the proper introductions to our guests this evening, I just wanted to let you know that I'm going to be showing some images and short clips of film while we talk tonight. So I'm just going to share my screen. And if you have any questions or would like to um, find out more about what Richard does, uh, please do put them into the Q&A and we will address these after our interview. As a committee member and a former chair of Contemporary British Silversmiths, I'd like to give you a bit of background about the association. We're an organisation with a current total membership of over 200 people. And I'm just going to share the screen so that I can show you the slide. So we've got 200 and we're largely run on voluntary contribution. Our values are excellence in design and manufacture. We also aim to collaborate and encourage creativity through all of our endeavors and public facing events. Our main remit is to raise the profile of design led silver and promote this nationally and internationally. And in recent years, we have launched a skills training program to preserve the heritage and pass on our craftsmanship. Tonight, we are delighted and proud to be holding an exclusive interview for this year's London Craft Week with one of our founder members, Richard Fox. He was also former chair of Contemporary British Silversmiths from 1999 to 2002. Richard is Managing Director of Fox Silver, one of the UK's leading design-led manufacturing companies, and he's created work for a huge variety of corporate, public sector, private and motorsports clients, including Downing Street, Lambeth Palace, Bulgari, Rolls-Royce Motorcars, Perno Ricard, and Formula One, to name a very select few. He's also the current Prime Warden of the Worshipful Company of Goldsmiths, one of the most prestigious positions in the precious metals industry and has been at the forefront of silver design throughout his career. He's been driving it forward and creating unique opportunities to showcase British silver internationally. And this up close and personal interview this evening, we hope will offer a really unique insight into the man behind the designer and the Prime Warden and what drives him and keeps him creative. Welcome to this event, Richard. Angela, um, thank you so much for inviting me uh, onto this webinar. It's uh, certainly a new way of working for so many more of us and uh, a, a very warm welcome to all the particip participants. Absolutely, uh, thank you very much for being here. Um, we thought this, this evening, because there are so many people watching, that know you and your work, but also an audience that perhaps aren't so familiar with what you do and what silversmithing is. We could start with a really short film um, that you made, and then also we will um, drill down into the detail of that in the interview so that we can pick out um, aspects of who is Richard Fox. So I'm just going to show that now. My name is Richard Fox. I'm the founder of Fox Silver Limited and I'm a designer silversmith. I set up my business in 1982. Uh, I left Royal College about the year before. I started all on my own. I had no equipment apart from a toolkit. I'm now uh, working in Croydon. We moved here in 2005 and uh, purchased a factory and from where we now manufacture items that go globally. 
I left with a toolkit and I just set up my business. Uh, it was really important to engage uh, with organisations. You create your work, you go off to do exhibitions and market yourself. You've just got to learn all of these different attributes, some of which are taught at college and some aren't. There can be a diversity of projects that we're working on at any one time, but it's usually focused around Formula One, Rolls-Royce motor cars, bespoke items that would fit into the cars, or it could even be whiskey bottle labels. So staff are engaged on multidisciplinary things. The staff are very skilled craftsmen, so they're excellent at the bench using age-old techniques of silversmithing. Others are very, very highly skilled engineers. Our trophy work, for example, we incorporate different processes that might not be associated with the silversmithing world. We may be growing something in a rapid prototyping machine, or we have a process called electroforming, invented in the 1840s, but we use it in a contemporary way and we can three dimensionally make precious metal onto other substrates. If we don't invest in new talent and utilise new techniques, we'll be left in the past. And that's a very dangerous area to be. It's vital that we keep abreast with the times, that we teach people, that we pass on our knowledge and uh, hopefully increase our trade. The craft of silversmithing has been going on for millennia. So we just put a small cog in that, so in that history. I see it as a celebration. People buy it because they want to celebrate something. It's a meaningful object to the recipient and will be for the rest of their lives and possibly forever. That's brilliant. Sorry, split. Stop that. <laughs> so that's wonderful. Um, it's a really fascinating overview, Richard. And I'd really like it if we could talk a little bit more about your background and also maybe hear from you on why you became so interested in design, in silversmithing, and then also how you really went on to setting up your first workshop, because that's really a challenge in itself. If we could hear a bit from you on that, I'd, I'd love that. Oh, goodness, that's a, a very long time ago, Angela, uh, getting long in the tooth. But uh, yes, I, I, I went on to uh, a technical college uh, in, in Warwickshire to uh, study sciences and maths and so on, but I had to take a complementary study. And for the life of me to this day, I have no idea why I chose jewellery. Uh, but as it turned out, uh, there was a guy there called Rex Billingham, uh, took me under his wing, um, I, I was the only person that chose that course uh, for that year and basically it just took over my life. I just loved it. I hated metal work at school, um, but here I was working in metal and uh, it was just uh, a revelation. Um, I hadn't studied art at school. Um, I, I, I was just on, on, uh, simply on the uh, sort of mathematics side of things. Um, I love technical drawing. Uh, my father was actually um, an engineer and uh, he worked in bizarrely anesthesia, so he was designing um, anesthetic uh, equipment. And so I suppose that's where my drafting interest came from. Anyway, cutting a long story short, I then went to, embarked on an art foundation course. Uh, I then applied to Middlesex uh, Poly, as it was then, uh, got in and uh, embarked on the three-dimensional design course. So that encompassed ceramics, furniture, um, leatherwork, glass, and of course, silversmithing. Um, so it gave me a really good grounding in materials and scale and all sorts of different things. But I, I held on to my love of silver uh, simply because I'd been to see an exhibition of Christopher Lawrence's work at the Goldsmiths Company. And seeing that silverware on the table, the tables, settings, that was breathtaking. And I guess that mapped my future because from the jewellery, I was interested in sculpture and I suppose the middle ground was tableware really. Um, uh, so that's what, what I uh, became interested in. Um, on, that, on that note, I'm just gonna show um, another slide of some pieces that you designed. If you could tell us about the sort of next stage of your your journey, because you, after when you were at the RCA, I think you, you designed these in your second year, didn't you? 
I did, yes. Uh, second year, I'd been out to uh, Paris. There, there were only four of us in my year, um, which was remarkable. So three jewellers, two of which came from Middlesex and myself. Um, and we all went off to Paris on a, on a jolly. Uh, no, actually to study uh, French jewellery and silverware. Uh, Christoph and people like that. <laughs> and um, uh, of course, there's uh, uh, Rogers Boberg, uh, you know, the Pompidou Center. And I came back and I was thinking about, you know, architecture. Architecture is a great influence. I love architecture. I, I like going to see anything from medieval churches to contemporary buildings in, in all sorts of different places in the world. Uh, so I always make sure I stop off somewhere like that. And of course, this had a great impact on me. And um, this, this was the result of seeing that building, I think. Uh, the actual candelabra articulates into quite a few different positions. Um, so that's, that was my second year piece, which I finished, I think, in my third year. And uh, in 1984, the Goldsmiths Company, this is three years after I left uh, the Royal College, commissioned me to, to make a pair of candelabra for their collection. Uh, but I think they had to be twice the size. So I had to make all new tooling, everything, but uh, eventually finished them off. And uh, uh, there you see, see them to this day and you can see them in the collection. That's fantastic. Um, I think we're having a little bit of trouble with seeing you when I'm doing the presentation. So I may dip in and out, um, mm -hmm. which may be slightly frustrating, but um, I hope Don't everybody worry. will bear <laughs> with us for now. Um, so I'm just going to share the screen again, and um, it's actually Tamazan, who we know quite well, who let us know that. So just bear with me for a moment, please, and Here see we if go. we can get that sorted. Um, I'm going to make you spotlight for everyone. Perhaps that makes makes yeah. it so that they can see you. That's so um, you you set up your workshop, and you've mentioned before that you sort of started out just with a toolbox and now you know you're running a global design-led silversmithing firm I mean how did you get from that toolkit to you know a big business taking on all those kind of clients I mean did did you have a first big break I mean how what how did it how did it work because I know I've been through it as a silversmith myself how how did you make that work for you um, actually, I, I often think uh, by, by chance, but uh, there was one amazing piece of, of, of advice from Gerald Benny, who's my professor, and he says, make sure you keep in touch with the design council, the crafts council, and the goldsmiths company. So whenever I made anything, I made sure they had photos of my work. I'd do any exhibition I could, um, and just generally try and sort of promote and push my work. And... Um, so yes, literally all I had was a toolkit when I left, which probably most of you have as well. Uh, over the years, I've obviously collected more and more equipment and more specialist equipment. Uh, but you know, the, the main hub is a traditional silversmithing workshop and we still we all use those techniques that we're all fairly familiar with. Um, so for the first few years, uh, and indeed it, uh, I didn't set, I set up a workshop for about six months, which didn't really work, it was tiny. Um, couldn't really, you know, you couldn't even, you could touch the walls with both both hands. Um, so then I teamed up with a mate of mine and we moved down to Peacock Yard in Kennington. And uh, that, that was quite a large uh, uh, a workshop in, by comparison, which meant I could then put in lathes and press equipment and, and folding equipment. And uh, that's really how it all started. Uh, so the shot you're seeing at the moment is, is the current workshop um and uh, you can see a formula one driver's trophy there that's the world championship trophy yeah, you can see the scale of it it's massive i mean uh, yeah. just looking at that in comparison to all the equipment which is you know big big pieces of kit yeah it's over half a meter high and weighs in about i think six six and a half kilos um so uh, unless this was something i designed in 1995 but prior to that, again in 94, um, Bernie Ecclestone contacted uh, the Goldsmiths Company and wanted a young silversmith to design a trophy for him. It was his trophy. And uh, six of us were put forward. I went to see him. Uh, we seemed to get on quite well together. Uh, asked me how long it would take to uh, make uh, a trophy or make some designs or, uh, for him. 
uh, it was a Monday. I said, uh, well, maybe sometime next week, towards the end of next week. He said, I leave for South Africa on Thursday morning. I said, see you on Wednesday night. And I think that that is what cemented our uh, um, friendship and uh, uh, the long period of time I was. I'm going to show these pieces because you, you mentioned to me before that two of the pieces that were quite pivotal in your career were these pieces for Bernie Eccleston, the Formula One trophy, and also the um, TV, the F1 TV trophy. Indeed. So the one on the left is the Bernie Eccleston trophy. This is a huge triptych, again, a half a metre high, and the, the, the um, sides fold in. So based on the chequered flag, Alan Mudd did the enamelling on that. Uh, Jane Short did the uh, enamelling on the oval. Uh, and, uh, and the reason for the, the sides, they're, they're rather like the grid. And so the winners uh, each year are engraved into each of the panels. And I can't remember, I think it's about 80 panels on this thing. Uh, and I didn't think that actually that would see me out. So uh, that, that was a design error. Um, <laughs> 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 um, and the TV trophy, uh, he gave me at the same time, he said, are you busy? I said, well, yes. He said, well, do you want to do the TV trophy? Yeah, I'll do that as well. So uh, this is what I came up with. Basically, it's a satellite dish with the globe enameled in the inside. And uh, that was enamelled by Maureen Edgar. And I think she said it took her something like 12 hours to pack all the enamels. And of course, it had to have several firings. Um, so uh, it was an amazing feat. And it's, it's about, I think from memory, about 13 inches in diameter. Sorry about going into the inches, uh, but uh, so about 330 mil diameter, something like that, on a granite base. Um, and then, of course, with the pair of candelabra as well, that was quite a good year. And uh, yeah, I've got the good. Bulgari pieces as well that you did. And, so. Yes, and uh, similarly, uh, Nicola uh, Bulgari, he he came to the company again and uh, selected three silversmiths, and uh, I was one of those, and uh, we became his sort of house designers uh for for many many years and in fact i still make some pieces for for the company now uh and what you're looking at here is a gullwing candelabra that i designed of which we've made many for his private restaurants and private dining rooms um and as a result of the success of that he wanted uh, bedside table lights which uh, you'll see if you stay in the knightsbridge hotel in london um, so, you know, that's working in uh, non-precious metals, so we're, we're working in silver plate uh, and working with electrics and electronics. Um, so it's about diversification and, uh, and just enjoying the world of design. So onward and upward. So that's again, awesome. that was a fantastic... I've got um, a myriad of images, actually, just to flick through, just to show the diversity of what you do. Hmm. And, the different clients that you work with, including, you know, royalty, fashion designers, whiskey manufacturers, you know, you, you really work with a, oh, you have on your hands, fantastic. I do, this, this is a bronze gold, gold one. <laughs> so you've got, a, you've got a silver one, a gold one, and a platinum one there. I these think. are the spirit of ecstasy, aren't they, for the royal Yeah, they go on the car, and you see them going whoosh. Yeah. <laughs> oh, by the way, if you try and steal one, they disappear within two hundredths of a second into the, uh, in, into the bonnet, so it's quicker than you can blink. Oh, so, so, uh, don't and then um, I have a selection here also of some of the sort of silver adornments that you've done for various whiskey manufacturers. Indeed, uh, we, well, the, the, it's this is the Perno Ricard, but they have very many brands, so Royal Salute, Valentine's, uh, Shivers, and. Uh, um, Glen Livet, I think, amongst many others. So these are just three of uh, three of the bottles we do, and these these sell for hundreds, if not tens of thousands of pounds. So um, yeah, crazy amounts of money. But uh, there are people out there in the globe, and they buy them. The one in the middle celebrated the Queen's fiftieth um, uh, year on the throne, and that was my very first piece I made for for them. And we had difficulty keeping up with the orders and they put three into Tokyo airport and within 20 minutes, they'd all sold. Uh, and they were 10,000 pounds a bottle then. And they all went to the same person. Wow. Uh, yeah, crazy. That's but then, yeah, so it, it's been fascinating. And we, we've uh, worked with other whiskey companies and uh, indeed made, made things that in, in gold and all sorts. So it's, it's quite... Uh, 
and and this is what most people know you for the trophies and I guess what I'm interested in because obviously we've seen a lot of uh these pieces over the years through publicity and what have you they really are your signature kind of mark the trophy design but how did you get to the point where you could employ someone how how did you get to that lift-off point you know where you got a job and you could really run with it and start taking all these big commissions on I mean were you really just lucky and got those two significant ones earlier on which led into this I mean how at what point did you get all of these different commissions? Goodness me, Angela. Um, I, well, going back again, uh, having left the Royal College of Art, a, a year later, I went off and I, uh, I was asked to go and lecture at uh, Middlesex for, I think it was just a term, um, uh, because one of the tutors had fallen ill. But I ended up staying there for seven years and um, uh, running the first year course as an associate lecturer there. And of course, um, that allowed, I was receiving an income there, which was great because it helped support the business while I developed it and grew it. And uh, what I would do during the holidays or, or particularly in the summer, I'd take on the student and uh, they would help me with my work. So that allowed me to do more to students. Uh, so, you know, the business would grow. And then of course, I'd be back teaching again and the business was still carrying on. So everything was piling up, but of course the students were back at, um, uh, at college. So, so I couldn't use them quite so much or employ them to the same degree. Uh, so, you know, really it was that push coming to shove. So I just started to um, employ people. There was quite a lot of subcontracting going on at the outset, uh, but that was quite difficult because um, of course there are all of these sort of things have um, very tight deadlines or can have very tight, tight deadlines, but they have to be there for the race or for the presentation. Um, so, you know, using subcontractors that are busy anyway can bring their own sets of problems. So I realized I had to start taking on staff. And uh, to this day, I've got, uh, there's three and my wife who's the jewelry side of the business and, uh, and myself, and then there's 10 other employees. So. Uh, yeah, that's that's quite a wage bill every month. So it uh, it, it does, it, but it has taken years to build. I mean, I, I'm now in the middle of my fourth decade. No, hang on, third decade. Uh, how many years now? 1980. I'm nearly 40 years on. <laughs> so There's going to be a party ahead. I think there is, isn't there? Yeah, actually, uh, next year, that will be the year I left the Royal College about 40 years ago. My goodness me. So um, <laughs> so here's another, uh, this is a fantastic thing. This is the Silver Trust um, uh, at Downing Street. And I think they have in excess of 400 pieces in the collection. And this is the state dining room silverware. And it's given so many opportunities for uh, silversmiths throughout the UK. Uh, to produce a design for, for Downing Street. So it's a fantastic collection of work. And I think they're still commissioning to this day, perhaps not quite so, so in such so, so quite volume. Yes, but, I think uh, um, the last one we saw um, just at the tail end of Silver Speaks was Junko Mori's table centerpiece. She did a very sculptural and abstract piece. So that was quite a departure. Yeah. So um, it's interesting, isn't it, to see the the development of how these pieces have been commissioned but I'm particularly interested in this in the bottom piece which um, with a gold ball in the center which for most people watching will not be able to really understand the scale of that but that is actually quite a significant size isn't it it's a it a is piece. it's called Principia and it weighs 22 kilos and that bottom dish is 600 millimeters in diameter and it's actually a water feature and uh, I worked in collaboration with Angela Connor, who's famous for her water features at um, uh, Chatsworth and various other places throughout the, the country. Uh, her pieces there are, used, are made out of stainless steel and they can be four meters high, you know, that sort of thing. So this is the sort of condensed version. And um, what happens is I, uh, one would fill the, um, orb or sphere in the center with water, uh, we know exactly how much to put in. So if you want it to last for an hour and 20 minutes or an hour and a half, we know how many milliliters to put in. And there are four pipettes um, placed around the base of the sphere. And when it's full, the leaves close. 
and there's a gas damper in there and the water drips out very slowly onto paddles below which then tip and go into the bowl below so there's this constant movement going on and after the hour and 20 minutes or whatever um, the gas damper can't hold on to it any longer because of course the weight of the water is gone and the, the leaves open and the golden orb rises and that's the end of a state dinner so the prime amazing. minister doesn't have to keep looking at his watch. Yeah. And this was an amazing collaboration between Angela and myself uh, which went it was it was a really difficult thing to make and uh, I think it took about 18 months 20 months in total but we got there in the end. So this sort of leads me to another question that I have about the importance of technology um, materials and also about um, processes really into your work because a lot of this really does require quite a lot of engineering but how important is it for you to make things by hand or machine I mean what's the what's the difference to you what does it mean to you to have um, you know different processes using uh, I, I think we have a combination of all of those techniques and I like to incorporate them. I, I, I just really enjoy the challenge of doing different things. So um, I'm not an atelier silversmith, obviously, because I, we employ so many people, although you could say or argue that I was when I first started out, but I was always making tools to press things. So like this candelabra, you saw sort of the uh, outset, but I made press tools to press all those elements. So you were always thinking about reduction in mind, not it, necessarily yeah. for runs, but to allow you to make bespoke things in a much easier way. Yes, yeah, so easier in inverted commas, because of course... Yes. Of course, not that easy at all. I'm tooling and how complicated it is. But I, I was always really fascinated about production techniques. So, you know, when I'm studying, I'd go up to Sheffield and go and visit um, all, all the manufacturers up there. I used to take students up there and to Birmingham. Uh, and so I was always intrigued by how um, uh, silverware can be accessible to a greater number of people. Because obviously, if, if you're making a one-off by hand, that's going to cost uh, a lot more than if you're you're perhaps able to make things in alternative ways. And indeed, we do that today. We, we uh, use CAD, but you can yeah, see- Yeah, I've got a, um, a clip. I'm just gonna play it. I don't know if you can talk over it or whether you- Yeah, can so- uh, It's well, a clip I, of your CAD it, file. It, everything that I design or that is designed starts with a pencil. Pencil, exhibit A. And um, I always have this with me. So it's really important that I do this question. And here you can see on the cab, this is actually the um, Abu Dhabi Formula One Grand Prix trophy growing in front of your eyes. And it, it's based on a um, falcon um, because that's an iconic uh, emblem of the company and of the uh, Arab Emirates. It's the fastest uh, animal on the planet. Uh, Formula One cars are as well. So it's a falcon diving through a vortex. Um, and that's basically it. So that is this. Uh, is this then to be electroformed? This piece. Yeah. So here you can see the render. So this is what we do um, after we've created that, and this is the actual object um, that has been grown in the tank. And earlier on in the film, you would have seen a black resin version of that that had just come out of the machine, so to speak. Um, uh, we, I now have a very large machine, which means I can grow those elements in one go. We didn't have that before. We used to have to glue them all together. And, a slide uh, of what nightmare. you call the family set. So, you so might here's the family, family set. So, um, uh, yeah, the, uh, Abu Dhabi have been amazing. I've, I've been working them since uh, the very beginning of the first Grand Prix. And we've made many iterations of different designs, but th this was last year's, this is uh, 2019. And uh, we've stuck with an extremely similar version this year. Um, if you put them next to one another, they're very slightly different, uh, but to the public, when you see them, they look the same. Look the same. Uh, yeah, and it's important because that carries the theme through for the uh, sponsor in- I was gonna say, it looks like you have a fantastic time when you're out there. There are these uh, huge <laughs> magnums of champagne with the trophies and the cars. And then um, what seems like 
a sort of party going on to the left. <laughs> um, but it must be quite an experience. Um, it takes you quite far and wide to do trophies that are international and having to go and attend the races and see your your trophies um, on the stage and also, you know, amongst other people on display. How, how is that to, to be part of that world? It's a, it's a wonderful experience, Angela. I mean, it's and also extremely privileged, I might add. Uh, I mean, not everybody can go into these, these, these parts of Formula One, for example. Um, I think it's to a degree, dare I say, uh, difficult for the public to get in. So I'm unbelievably privileged to be able to uh, actually go and meet the drivers, meet meet the teams, and meet the people behind it. Um, you know, when, when somebody, you can see from that photo on the left, everybody's in party mode at the end of the race. I mean, they really do go let their hair down. It's, it's it also fun. gives you a real feeling of scale because you can see how heavy that piece is, you know, and you must be thinking, don't drop that. <laughs> <laughs> oh yeah, we don't skip on weight. We don't yeah. skimp on weight at all. Uh, and that was another thing Gerald told me: never skimp. Never skimp. <laughs> uh, um, no, no. <laughs> there's there's much to cover, and I'm aware of time, so I just want to flick forward. But one of the things I wanted to talk to you about was your sort of design ethos and basically your aesthetic and you know what is great design to you I mean this is a set of your cutlery that you've designed very recently that was um, featured for made for the table for the goldsmiths company um, you don't have to talk about this piece in particular but you know is it about clean lines what 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 is it for you what how do you conceive your designs well in in the case of cutlery it's all it, this is all about touch and feel and your and senses because of course you're putting things in your mouth you're having to pick things up you're holding the object so you've got to think about balance um, you've got to think about grace so uh, i called the set fluere uh, and in fact as a result of this going into the exhibition again bulgari bought the design um, so, uh, which is amazing. So they now have the rights to uh, manufacture this in in uh, base metals and stainless steel. But they very That's kindly allowed me to keep the silver version. Um, <laughs> not quite sure why, but uh, I'm, again, you know, hugely honoured. So, um, in in those terms, it's always about function. There's the form follows function, you know, that sort of thing. Um, I've always loved sculpture, people like William Turnbull, very s s sort of smooth, reflective form. So most of my work is polished. It's quite uh, distinctive. Whenever I see a piece of yours, I can tell it's a Richard Fox piece. So that's <laughs> quite a success in itself, I would, wow. I would say. Um, <laughs> one one of the things that I find quite fascinating is you're often challenged with um, a particular a design that isn't necessarily going to be 100% your aesthetic, like for example, the Azerbaijan trophy. No. And, and this is where I think, maybe you can talk a little bit about this, but, but essentially this is where I think um, you need to have a bit more of an awareness as a designer about cultures and about your audience and about who you're designing for. And I just wondered how you came to the conclusion of this trophy design. Yeah, so every, every now and again, you, you're throwing something into the mix, and this was certainly one of them. And you're quite right, whenever I'm designing trophies or whatever it may be, I'm looking at what, where, why, what part of the world, how is it going to be used, all these sort of things. And um, this is the one that, uh, I think the first one I made for Baku. And uh, I'd sent off several designs because I, Baku is very famous for its carpet making. It's very famous for um, the, the, the oil that it produces and, and so on and so forth. It's also a very beautiful country um, and got, uh, you know, very strong cultural links going back millennia. Um, anyway, we, we were talking about it and then suddenly um, the promoter decided, he said, I know, I want a carpet, but I want to flying carpet that's on fire and I thought what on earth how what am I going to do here so of course you immediately think of uh, cartoons you know things like that so uh, what I've done here it's <laughs> there's a building in Baku that's uh, it's a bit like a Swiss roll but it's the roll of a carpet so I'm sort of put that up vertically uh, but then I had the idea of a candle flame and uh, a wrap of a carpet so the central column is a carpet and if you look you can't quite see it in the right hand photo but as it swirls around it turns into a point that's a little bit like a flicker of a 
uh, a flame. And the inside of that is then red gold plated. So when you look down, it, it looks like it's on fun. And that's brilliant. Basically, that's, that's um, I love it. I think how, it's how it came about. I think it's really a challenge for you to have to think from one um, design idea to another, especially when you're so busy and you're working with so many different clients. But also I find it um, interesting that whilst you're using CAD, you obviously have the mind of an engineer and looking at these technical drawings, they're very um, considered and complicated and you can see how you will be thinking about construction. You said before, a lot of this has come about because your father was a, a draftsman. So yes, I, th I think of... that certainly rubbed off on me, Angela. Yeah. And here you can see, this is going back uh, a few years, that previous photo of the European Grand Prix. I had, I think, three or four weeks in which to design and make those. And uh, they were so hot off the forge, I actually drove up with them. I didn't have a pass to get in, they refused me. So I opened the boot of the car and said, well, if you don't let me in, you can't have the trophies. Anyway, that's another story. Um, <laughs> <laughs> and this is uh, a ciborium uh, for the inner temple, which you can see in London in, in Hoban. And my wife carved the Pegasus and the, uh, yes, the flying Pegasus actually on the foot. And it's also repeated on the uh, top of the chalice lid. Nice. So I think she did um, the as well. Oh, look, there's a hallmark. There's a hallmark. So um, just wondered on hallmarking, how you feel about hallmarking, your signature as a hallmark, what importance that has to you, how your clients respond to it, and also whether the introduction of laser marking revolutionised your business or not. I mean, I know from my perspective, it's certainly cut down cleaning up time because for those that don't know, when you have a mark that's struck with a traditional punch, it's very beautiful and it really feels like a beautiful historical mark, but it does somewhat distort the material. So just wondered how you feel about, yeah, the process of laser marking and also what it means to have that mark. Um, uh, I cherish it. Uh, that RNF, I think I registered that mark in either 1976 or 77. So, you know, it's really important. That's mine and it will stay with me until I stop, I guess. Um, with uh, laser marking, brilliant if you've got really complicated things that you can't uh, then reset the mark or if it's a hollow item, for example. I mean, that, that, that's quite, it's, it's been life changing for the silversmith. But, you know, I really do like a struck mark and you can see one below there on the uh, foot of a trophy. And I usually like to put them on a fairly large size, particularly on, on something that's over half a metre high. Uh, so that people really know and it's there and understand this. And don't forget, this is the oldest form of consumer protectionism in the world. It's been going for over 700 years. And do you feel that this really is very important to your clients? Like when you deliver a trophy, is the hallmark part of the conversation of the delivery? Do they want to see where it is and discuss it with you and have a look at that? And do you make it a feature of the trophy? They do indeed. And in fact, we made some trophies, uh, replicas, I think it was for Mercedes, um, uh, just as lockdown came. And of course we couldn't get them hallmarked. Uh, they were quite expensive. And um, they said they did take them and they were very generous and paid me for them but i had to then uh return them and get them hallmarked they wanted their hallmarks on it it's it's uh, it, it's really important that they're there and uh, it's 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 recognized globally it, it yeah. is uh, i mean i know i appreciate my mark um and for those that don't know we choose how they're presented so no other rnf could have exactly the format that you have it's Indeed. going to be in a specific shape and it's only that one mark can ever be registered at that time, which I do find very satisfying indeed. Yeah. Um, and then just talking, I mean, we've talked about some of your successes and you talked about some of the cornerstones of your successes. Um, obviously, all of the big commissions came your way with a lot of hard work and determination and drive and you've embraced all these new technologies but would you say that um really at the sort of heart of it all is your engagement with clients and about building relationships undoubtedly it's so important to do that um and uh, 
just following up, following up with your client. And of course, when you finish your piece, you, it's so important that you hand deliver it, if, you, if at all possible. If you can't, then phone them or have a video call with them, whatever you want to do. Um, if you don't hear from people, contact them. Just, you know, say, how are things? You know, is there anything happening? I, I used to do that quite a lot with um, um, Mr. Ecclestone, Bernie Ecclestone. And I usually got a very um, curt response, uh, just saying, what do you want? <laughs> but um, I, I'd say, um, well, any trophies going? You know, that's <laughs> and uh, uh, yeah, because we got on, that was fine. But um, generally, I think it's really important to let uh, communicate and let people know what you're doing, you know, what, what, what you're up to. Um, yeah. And on uh, that note, um, I just wanted to talk about your role as Prime Warden and also um, trustee of the Goldsmith Centre. You obviously do a lot of wider work for our industry and you've contributed to our industry over the years. And I wonder how you feel about your current role. I mean, obviously, um, it's not quite the same as leaving a trail of happy customers, but it does bring you somewhat some satisfaction. And there's obviously a reason for you doing it. How do you feel about um, being in this particular position at the moment as the current Prime Warden? Well, uh, Angela, as you know, it's been challenging, to say the least. It's not what I wanted, not what I expected in terms of this awful COVID. We've had absolutely no uh, contact with any of our membership, with the public. Um, we've not had any uh, dinners and uh, wonderful uh, evenings. That's why I'm so slim. Um, and we miss that, that it's dreadful, it's really bad. But one of the great things we were able to do right at the beginning of lockdown was the Goldsmiths um, um, COVID-19 fund. Uh, we managed to secure a million pounds um, from the court and from the company. And uh, I think about uh, 700,000 or 800,000 has now been dispersed between 500 uh, individuals and businesses throughout the UK in the form of grants. That, so that was really gratefully received and hopefully saved a lot of people from uh, perhaps thinking they might go under or just stopping work. Um, there's a little bit left over and pan out, um, but there's, there is a, a small fund left. Um, and of course, uh, the Goldsmiths Fair um, there's the team at, at the company that put that together have been exemplary, as, as have the rest of the staff there. And, you know, that, that platform didn't exist three months ago. And now uh, the, the, all, all the participants there had a global platform. That's and it. I, I think this whole, the, the one positive, if you can take anything away, or whilst it hasn't been the experience you perhaps may have hoped, is this sort of digital connection, this um, ability to be global and doing things online. We're all learning how to do this. So for example, with this event where we would normally be in a room, but what we're realizing is like tonight, we have lots of people joining us from all around the world, from Europe, from across the country. And that isn't something that would ordinarily be able to happen. Indeed, um, uh, this is uh, making us thinking of new ways of working and how, how we can outreach. We were already beginning to think about that, uh, just outreaching into the regions and Scotland and, and Ireland, but th this is a game changer. So uh, uh, there's a lot going on behind the scenes and uh, you'll hear more and more about that. And hopefully uh, I'll be able to continue that as uh, trade warden next year. So uh, yeah, I, I won't disappear quite. <laughs> That's really exciting. Um, I obviously know you from being so involved over the years as the former chair of CBS, treasurer. You've been one of the founder members. Um, this is a, an exhibition that you helped and went over to Denmark, Holdinghus um, Castle. Um, how, is, how important has it been to be involved with CBS? It's, um, I should say, contemporary British silversmiths for those watching. Um, it's, it's, it's always been a strength that we can be immediate with what we're doing and react and respond and be able to deliver. But it has made quite a difference to a lot of different uh, silversmiths over the years. Um, how, how, how do you feel about having started such a, an organisation, which is really important? Do you feel it's as important today as it was then? Probably more so, actually. Um, yeah, absolutely vital. Uh, it wasn't just me that started it. There, there were about 20 of us or so, but uh, 
Uh, Howard Flynn became chair and I became vice chair and I moved into chair three, three years later in 1999. So, um, but at that point, we, we really wanted to outreach. Uh, we wanted to promote very uh, contemporary silver. Um, because there was a group, there were about 30 or 40, I think, when I was chair, maybe 50 of us. Um, it meant that we could ask each silversmith to give one piece. And then suddenly we'd have an extremely contemporary exhibition. Yeah, I was going to show these yeah. pieces. So one of the things yeah. you did say to me before was working to themed exhibitions allowed you to create quite unique work. Hmm. Which I find, um... Yeah, and, and I think that, uh, and for all of us, uh, likewise. And what was fascinating, of course, if you just had a word that was side by side or ten or whatever, the way in which everybody interpreted that that um, small word was remarkable, and it was inspiring, and it allowed us to go to places where we wouldn't normally go, and it it kind of woke the public up a bit. And it wasn't as though um, the Cross Council, the Goldsmiths Company, or whoever weren't doing the, their bit, of course they were, but in a slightly different way. And of course they had slightly different parameters and their exhibitions might um, uh, be two, three, four years in the planning. We could do one in two or three months. So, you know, it's a completely different thing. Um, and uh, people began to hear about this. We knew a, a new gallery owner in Washington. And I just happened to mention, you know, maybe we should do an exhibition. And the next thing we knew, we had a big exhibition over in Washington. Um, DC and that kind of got us thinking uh, well maybe we could do other ones um, uh, we knew Christopher English he, he uh, was secretary of the Silver Trust and he was taking the collection um, around the world every other year and exhibiting it in the UK on, on those other years and uh, we, we kind of made a partnership and we exhibited alongside which opened up um, Denmark, Koldinghaus, the Danish Smiths yeah. Association. We went to Finland. Um, I think at one stage, uh, and then we had symposiums over here and invited other silversmithing groups. Oh, it's fantastic. I mean, it really has, the organization really has grown in stature, hasn't it? I mean, it's become yeah. something else. It's uh, yeah. quite a recognizable brand now. And, and we've obviously, developed quite a cohesive brand of partners. I mean, we're really pleased that we're obviously we're working with London Craft Week on this and then obviously with the SA office and obviously we work with the Goldsmiths Company in the centre. And I find it um, amazing that you and your peers conceived this that many years ago and yet it's so needed now. And that's one of the reasons obviously why we have a skills training programme on top of all of the profile raising things that we do because we really need to preserve our heritage. I, th I think it's... Um, we do, and indeed now, Angela, you're you're actually teaching people online. You know, we've run courses and so on. You're in partnership with Goldsmith Centre or Goldsmith Centre in partnership with you, uh, whichever way it is. And uh, it, that's what I meant by there's uh, uh, these new new ways of delivering outreaching, not only to the UK but further afield. And um, you know, the world's our oyster, and I, I think we really should uh, take the bull by the horns and. Uh, uh, move things onward and upward. So, uh, you know, I take my hat off to all those of you that have uh, carried that sort of, um, uh, that light forward. And it, it really has been quite remarkable. And uh, uh, Before you left as treasurer, you were obviously part of the campaign to do Silver Speaks, which was quite a pivotal campaign. And we got to work with lots of partners during that time, including lots of people, um, industry experts like Hiram Painter, which we're really grateful for. But here you can see a snapshot of all the sort of really significant things that we've been doing over the years. And where do you think we go now? I mean, what what is next for the future of silver? I mean, we've, we've sort of got to a point where there has been a sort of renaissance and definitely an interest in contemporary design in silver. Where do you feel we're going in the future? Well, I, I think uh, now we're 200 strong, you say? I mean, that's incredible. Um, it just goes to show that uh, the, uh, the young designers that are leaving uh, university have something to aim for. And we are a vehicle for those young, young people coming into our industry and um, we can be extremely supportive. So I think more support there. Um, but also it means that uh, you as more experienced people can then start uh, passing on some of the knowledge that you have. But I think we carry on in similar ways by probably partnering, maybe partnering again with uh, auction houses, or um, we can have our own platforms 
and reach out globally that way. But also uh, we have a wealth of knowledge and that knowledge is power. And that means that we can educate. So I, I think all of those things together are the way forward. Brilliant. And do you think you'll maybe get a holiday at some point or a little bit of gardening? <laughs> somewhere with a, a sketchbook and pencil in hand. Do you, um, will you get some time off, do you think? Or after goodness, you I'm, I'm not sure about that, that this year, and yeah. it's been pretty busy. Um, uh, not least with uh, work, funnily enough, we're, we're seeing a lot more work come in at the moment. Uh, long may that last, but also with the goldsmiths and being prime warden, uh, that keeps me fairly busy. Uh, <laughs> Monday, I'll be, um, uh, 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 I'll be on trial of the picks. I'm going to stop sharing the screen so that we can see if you've got any questions. It's been absolutely fascinating, but I'm sure it's not over yet. We've got a few questions here. Mm -hmm. um, Sylvia Weidenbuck, what kind of advice do you have for the next generation of silversmith? Um, well, I, I think it's probably very similar to my own. If you have some pieces of work, try and exhibit them, get them into a retailer. Um, uh, but make sure they move around. Um, I think uh, certainly engage with the CBS. Uh, uh, it's a wonderful organisation. And uh, also make yourself known to uh, the Goldsmiths uh, Company as well. So um, start with a uh, small uh, toolkit and off you go. <laughs> Yeah, I think now is a good time. It felt for some time in my past, certainly a bit rocky, but it's certainly feeling like a stronger uh, place to be as a silversmith. I think there's definitely a renewed interest in buying unique objects and designed objects. So yeah, well, certainly now's a good time. And, and, and now many, many of the younger generation um, are far more inter internet savvy than I am. That's right. Uh, there's Instagram and all sorts of things. So you can push your work out and, you know, get some people following you, that sort of thing. So uh, that's don't forget, right, yeah. Social media. fax machines haven't uh, even been invented. So, you know, <laughs> that shows my well, life, doesn't it? <laughs> I think the mobile phone had just about come in when I was starting out, but... Um, really? <laughs> Only just. Um, I have a question from David. How many replica Formula One trophies have you been asked to make for either drivers or manufacturers? That's quite a good question. Can you um, receive that? Uh, more than one a year since 1958. Michael Schumacher had seven. How many have you done? Oh, how, how many have I made? Yeah. Um, Personally. For drivers or manufacturers, how many replicas have you had to do? Um, well, that's what I meant. So uh, that would be 25 plus a few more, about 30 of the drivers and the constructors slightly less. But I made the originals myself. That's great. And was good I business. Have, help <laughs> you have to make more. I, I did um, have some, some help from John, my manager, by the way. Yes, yeah, so you've got a great team, I know. But, um, yeah. Nigel Israel, do the items that you make for Bulgari, for instance, have your mark or Bulgar Bulgari's mark? Uh, I have to say they do not have my mark on, apart from the very first ones I designed and made, which used to make him furious. Um, <laughs> so, I, yeah. <laughs> and he made me put the Bulgari cartouche uh, next to the hallmark. But, Oh, the very first ones always had my whole mark. But you have the uh, promotion and everybody knows that you've designed those candlesticks. Uh, yeah, they've been really good, actually, uh, since then. They've been, they've it's been nice good. that you're allowed to talk about it, which is well, something, because I know a lot of... That might be the end of my relationship with yeah. Bulgari now. <laughs> but a lot of silversmiths maybe do work, particularly for fashion designers, and they're not allowed to talk about the project. So this is no, fantastic. Well, it does happen, but uh, I think uh, in, over time that's changed. And... Uh, yeah, I mean, I've had signed NDAs and I think I'm on one with them at the moment. But um, I'm a great believer that designers should should be known, you know, at the end of the yeah. day. If you've done it, then um, why, why not? And uh, they should have faith in, in uh, supporting you because that, why, why would they go to you otherwise? You know, so that, that's my... I'm uh, trying to get all the questions <laughs> in because they're coming in thick and fast. But I have one here from Rowney Hickson. What is the piece or pieces you have made that have been the most fun or given you the most joy? 
which we don't ask ourselves very much based on how much hard work it is to make work. But yeah. there must have been some pieces that gave oh, you... Yeah, I mean, there, there are quite a number, but, uh, you know, it's always, always the difficult ones, which when you finish, you think, thank God for that. But then maybe six months later, you think, yeah, that was really good. Um, I think really the, the, in terms of satisfaction, still those Formula One drivers trophies, because it was also the World Ch uh, Rally Championship. So I had four to make in nine weeks, and uh, which was stupid really. Um, as John, my manager says, I don't know the word no. Um, <laughs> that was, uh, yeah, uh, that's another story. Um, and the reason being, a couple of weeks before I'd written to Ferrari, oh no, not to Ferrari, I beg your pardon, to Asprey, who had just started sponsoring Ferrari. And I thought, crikey, you know, if they're in now, I'm going to lose the, all my commission work to them. So I wrote to them, they said, no, thank you very much. Nice lesson back. We have our own team of designers. The very next day, Bernie phoned up and said, Richard, can you design the um, drivers, constructors and both the World Rally trophies? And that was really very satisfying. So that was good. Um, and I think of my most recent ones, then it would have to be the Abu Dhabi trophies because I was playing with technology that I didn't know would work. And if it didn't work, I would have been deep in the mire because there yeah. wasn't enough time. But would you say um, that's what keeps you going is that sort of experimentation time because otherwise it could feel like you're just running the treadmill. So it's yeah. nice to be able to be a bit creative in a different way, even if it's just experimenting with CAD. Yes, indeed. Um, and uh, that, that, I think, is what keeps driving forward. And, you know, one of the really good things is with CBS, if they're um, having an exhibition and they theme it, then uh, that allows me to do something that is quite different from what I'm doing normally. Uh, that said, if we're making, making these big trophies, different things can happen when you're trying to replicate them. And quite often you don't see that coming. So it's not always plain sailing. When you've already made one, it's not necessarily that the next one's going to behave in the same way. So <laughs> word of warning. <laughs> and uh, on that note about sort of pushing yourself and challenging yourself, I have a, um, a message here from Rebecca De Quinn. Should contemporary makers be pushing the boundaries between metal crafts, design and fine art? Yes, why not? I don't see yeah. an issue with that at all. I, th I think anything that challenges people's perception is a good thing. Um, in fact, we, we talked about this, and we didn't talk about it in the interview this evening, but we talked about this prior, about um, you using a lot of technology and processes that perhaps aren't associated with silversmithing. And you said to me, it's about perception. Yes, um, I suppose that relates to Oh, it's also about lateral thinking as well. It's about how you can use, um, you know, you could be using somebody else to help you make something where, where, where you're working with collaborations, for example. Uh, I mean, recently I was working with uh, Lasse Bering and you would have seen one of his pieces in my film. Um, um, so I can't, uh, I have to say that, that that was his, not mine, but we, we work quite closely on the philosophies and so on. Um, uh, I think, yeah, I mean, I quite like, using bits of kit and then trying to work out how I can use other things to embellish or to add to, so it's additive. Uh, and we could use electroforming, for example, or we can use traditional spinning or raising or casting. There's all these different things. So I'm, I'm using different techniques all the time. I just like mixing them up and seeing, seeing what will happen. So, um, yeah. And then of course, uh, those boundaries that you can blur between sculpture, fine art, um, and mixing those materials and those techniques can be very interesting, can be fascinating. Absolutely. I, I think that's really important to challenge not only your own perception, but the public's perception. And it, that can be really challenging, of course, if you're working to briefs, which I do on a regular basis, that, that can be difficult. Mm. Because you know, your, client, your, client, your client can be very conservative sometimes and it's about you leading them on a journey and having the confidence to be able to do that. So you would say to a certain extent you, you don't really want to compromise in your, your design 
um, principles, as it were. You want to try and get your client to come on board with the way that you would think oh, about. Yeah, and I think yeah. we should all we should all try to do that. Every now and again, somebody might come along and say, "Can you make a replica of this?" And you can either say yes or no. It depends on how the business is going, I suppose. But as long as you remain true to yourself with your own design work, then I think that's that's uh, uh, critical. I've got a few more questions. I've got some very complimentary remarks coming through, which is very nice, and some congratulations on your wardenship. Um, but I've still got a few questions. If we've got a few minutes, um, we're running over a couple of minutes, but I think it's okay. So I've got one here from Marianne Simmons. There are a lot of design firms out there. In your opinion, how important is it to understand the material that you're designing for? I guess she's talking about whether you're doing something in glass or ceramics or... Well, I have worked in glass and ceramics, indeed, you know, with the whiskey, um, with that um, Royal Salute bottle. I had to work closely uh, with the porcelain manufacturer in Stoke-on-Trent. Um, uh, glass, I've worked with the Eater Glass in uh, Finland, and uh, uh, I've had work manufactured out there um, and then sold throughout Scandinavia. Um, so, you know, understanding some of these elements is important but if you haven't trained in them you wouldn't necessarily know how that works um is it important yes it is um, i was lucky i uh, guess you I, just I, end up having to um, become expert in other fields there isn't any choice other than to understand the other component part that you might be working with or how something might fit with your silver piece I think that comes with the experience, you know, over time. But um, I was really lucky because I was at college in those halcyon days where we were being, we were allowed to use all sorts of different materials. I was trained as a three-dimensional designer, as uh, Rebecca was actually. She was uh, a student when I was a tutor there, and uh, went went on into our profession, which is fantastic. Rebecca um, Quinn, for those that don't know. Yes. Yeah, yeah, <laughs> we go back um, the way, don't we? Um, and then you know, it's just. It, for me, I find that intriguing and at the same time challenging, especially if I don't know if it's going to work. So there's a lot of uh, bated breath going on at times. But it's just about being confident and working through it and you, you'll get there, definitely. And Marianne, I hope you enjoyed America. That was a great uh, experience. Uh, Marianne and I worked very closely together on that uh, exhibition. And, uh, the one in Washington. Uh, yeah, that was uh, quite sad. That, that was the catalyst for more to come. Um, I've got a couple more questions, but we are running a bit out of time. So I'll just take one. And I'm not quite sure whether this is something you've even begun to thought, think about. This is from Sally Dodson. She wondered where you see the future of Fox Silver going when you retire. Do you ever see the business being handed on and continuing without you? Which is a bit of a strange question to end on. I'm sorry to ask you that one. <laughs> but, um, um, that, you've become quite a distinctive brand. I mean, you've got a lot of uh, a back catalogue and a lot of clients to bring with you. And I suspect you'd be able to keep going beyond your actual time at the bench. So how do you see that happening? Um, do designers ever retire? Yeah. So basically, you're going to be working till you're 90 odd. Yeah, if I stop, yeah. I'll probably kill you. Sorry, Serena. So, <laughs> <laughs> yeah, uh, I'll be in trouble now when I get back. <laughs> um, no, I, 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 yeah, succession planning. It, we, we are discussing it. Uh, I have four wonderful children, um, uh, three of which, uh, of whom are in the arts, uh, and uh, James is not. But, uh, you know, the business has grown now, so I, any one of them could do something. And indeed, um, Sarah directed that film that you saw at the beginning of my, my eldest daughter. Um, so, and they've all been immersed in the business since, you know, they were embryos. Basically. Well, I think some people will have remembered seeing a little clip of Serena holding one of the children and some of the others <laughs> in the car. I mean, obviously, they've been in and out of various bits of your business life for a long time, which um, is fascinating. Yeah, that, that was that brief moment in Formula Ford where we had three seasons. We did very well until the driver knocked three corners off the car and that was it. <laughs> Fantastic. I think, I think on that, that's a high note to end on, that you obviously got somewhere to go with your business, which is wonderful. But I just wanted to thank you very, very much for this evening for being my guest and our guest, Contemporary British Silversmiths, as we host this webinar. It's been really fascinating. And also just wondered um, what's next for you, like 
to tomorrow, the next day, week? Have you got projects? Are you back onto the Goldsmiths Company business? Uh, well, fortunately, I've um, I wrote my speech for the trial of the picks. So the trial of the picks is Monday. Um, again, that's going to be uh, on the internet on Zoom, I believe, um, which is a great shame. And this this goes back way over seven hundred years. So, um, and it's basically the uh, trialing uh, the 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 Chancellor of the Exchequer to make sure that the uh, Royal Mint is doing their job properly and uh, that the coinage of the realm is up to scratch and that of other uh, countries, New Zealand, for example, um, and making sure that all the commemorative coins, the gold ones, are of the right carat. So uh, this, this will be the gold, result. Yeah, in all of that. So, you know, it's, uh, it, it's an ever-changing world for me and uh, one that we're continually uh, looking at, planning, seeing how we can uh, promote uh, as trade Prime Warden, it's such an honour uh, to be in that position. I, do, I don't think I ever really um, planned it. It was just something that happened to me because I, I, I suppose I was the one that wanted to go on the committee and then, you know, there, there weren't a lot of silversmiths around then and so on. So slowly but surely they asked me to go on other committees and so on. And then suddenly I found myself here. Richard, it sounds like you just can't help yourself. <laughs> <laughs> on that note I think we should probably end this interview because I'm quite aware it's a Friday evening everybody wants to go off and have a lovely drink and I'm going to toast you when I finish the interview tonight but thank you so much for everything and I really enjoyed it I hope everybody else did too well thank you for the opportunity and uh, I, I'm glad that I, oh, I hope everybody enjoyed uh, enjoyed my uh discussion with Angela. I've had some really nice um, comments saying how much people enjoyed it so I think you can rest assured that was that was successful and everybody enjoyed your your history and your current um, working practice yeah it's brilliant thank you very very much Richard. Pleasure. Thank you.